And you know, Netflix has been very reliable in my experience. I watch it every so often during the week and I never really have any issues with, with uh, buffering or anything like that. And you know, they transfer so much data. It's an insane amount of data to the user and from the user. And we see sites with less traffic go down more often. So I really want to learn how you guys were able to do this. And so what I want to focus on in this section of the interview is, just like I said, how do you do it? What's the secret? And let's start off by talking about the Netflix architecture. Can you paint us a, a picture of what that looks like? Yeah, so the secret is magic. Uh, the, the Netflix architecture is a microservices architecture. Uh, and that's really where all of that, a lot of that reliability comes in. Uh, the other secret is testing. So I'll talk about the architecture first. So it's all microservices. Uh, it didn't used to be. It used to be one big monolith. Uh, but it got broken out into services, and the advantages that services provide are help a lot. So you can scale each service independently, uh, you can develop each service independently, you can debug them independently, which limits the scope of debugging. Uh, so it helps a lot during outages, because once we can zero in on a particular service that is causing a problem, it's a lot easier to debug, uh, because you know that it's just that service and there's just a small scope. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's also the independent scaling, so each service can scale independently as necessary. Uh, and then there's just the general architecture of sort of what I like to call doing it, it, everything in threes. So uh, we use uh, three availability zones, or they, I should say, use three availability zones per uh, region and uh, multiple regions as well. So uh, that happens to be three, but that's not actually necessary. Uh, and then being able to withstand the, the loss of an entire zone, it makes it much more reliable. So because everything is architected with this in idea of being able to run with the two of three zones, um, that makes it much more reliable. And the way we know that it works is through testing. So you know, all the testing is done in production. There's the Chaos Monkey, which is killing just individual instances, and the Chaos Gorilla, which is doing entire zones. And the secret there is practice, right? We, you know, you would joke about 20 years ago about the sysadmin who took backups but never restored them. That's not. That means they didn't actually take their backup, right? So today, it's it's you you. If you don't do your testing, then you're not going to know whether you're reliable. And so that's hmm. a really important part of it. So why doesn't everybody use this kind of microservice? Why is Reddit still using a monolithic uh, architecture instead of going with microservices? So there's a lot of overhead to doing it. There's a, a lot of overhead to running a microservice architecture. You need to have a platform to do it upon. So what we have what we found, what I found talking to a bunch of different companies is basically anyone who is doing microservices is spending about 25% of their engineering effort on their platform, on wow. running their services. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is a big overhead and a big reason a lot of smaller companies don't do it. And a lot of bigger companies take a while to get there. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, the company that I just founded is here to solve that problem. That is the, exactly the problem we are trying to solve. We're trying to essentially bring that platform to everybody so they don't have to spend the time building it. And this is cloud native you're, you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, cloud native. So how do you make sure that Netflix can scale to, to spikes in traffic then? Do you just spin up more services? Or, because obviously that seems very expensive if you always keep the same amount of, of uh, machines even though you don't need them. How does that work? So the, the, the trick is in auto-scaling. Uh, there's the auto-scaler, there's two kinds of auto-scaling. There's reactive auto-scaling and predictive auto-scaling. Uh, reactive is the kind that Amazon provides where you can say, you know, when this particular measurement gets too high, uh, launch more instances. Uh, predictive is something that Netflix actually built for itself, which essentially predicts how much traffic is expected to happen and then scales up ahead of the prediction. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing is that the quicker you can get your boot up time, the smaller overhead you need to have. So if your boot up time is five minutes, then what you need to do is you need to make sure that you have enough infrastructure mm -hmm. to handle the maximum predicted increase in the next five minutes. But if your startup time is 30 seconds, then you only need 30 seconds worth of overhead. And so you can do that with Netflix because it's that predictive, like you're able to actually predict, okay, at these times during the day, we have more traffic, uh, we're yeah. releasing this show, etc. So it, it's that precise? Yeah, so the predictions are actually there's a lot of complicated math behind them, but it's very smooth. Uh, the curves are very smooth. People's watching habits are very regular. So uh, they're actually fairly predictable. Like it, it, you, can, you can predict, it's pretty much just a very smooth curve up and down throughout the day. Uh, the main exception being Saturday morning, there's just a huge spike as all the kids <laughs> jump on to watch TV. 
Uh, and there's an interesting little spike at every hour. So right on the hour mark, as tra traditional linear TV, whatever show just ended, people will jump on to Netflix. Mm -hmm. The really interesting stuff to predict is around things like uh, the Oscars and the Super Bowl, uh, because those cause really weird viewing patterns. Mm -hmm. Like the moment the Super Bowl ends, Netflix skyrockets. <laughs> oh, uh, wow, yeah. Because, <laughs> okay, well, because everybody sucks. has been using their big TVs to watch the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. And as soon as it's over, they're like, well, now what are we going to watch? Oh, let's <laughs> turn on Netflix because it's Sunday and there's nothing else on TV. Right. And entertain the company that's at the house. And, and they're... Exactly. <laughs> that makes sense. That are sitting at the house or whatever. Yeah. That's funny. So you talked about the time it takes to provision a machine like this. And I've heard you uh, talk about baking mm -hmm. and how that's different from bootstrapping or another technique. So yeah. can you tell us a little bit more about that process? What is baking? Yeah, so so it's interesting. In Netflix, we believe in in fully baked images. So essentially, what that means is a uh, machine that when you turn it on, it's ready to serve traffic. Uh, it just boots up and is ready to go. It doesn't have to download any code. It doesn't have to download any configuration. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first got to Netflix, I was shocked that this is how they do everything, right. and I I was like, this, I mean, this feels terrible. But I've learned I learned to love it. Uh, it really helps with, uh, well, one, reducing startup time, uh, and two, uh, homogeneity. It means that when I'm running a cluster of machines, I know that all of those machines are identical. I don't have to worry about whether one of them got an update yet or not. Uh, and when I deploy new code, I don't have to worry about, you know, how it has the role, the, how's that code role going, which machines have which version, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of advantages to it. Uh, it essentially means... The, the, the biggest downside to it is is rapid development. So you have to wait for the bake to finish. You're essentially taking the startup configuration time and putting it all in the front. Uh, so it does slow down development a bit. And so some people do have workarounds where they'll push code directly out as they're developing. And then the final step will be to bake a machine image and make sure that it works mm -hmm. fully baked. So would you only use baking like this at a Netflix scale? Or when does it not make sense? Is it just when you don't want to sacrifice the development time? So it really makes sense for everybody, um, but there is the big trade-off. So when you're early on, it probably doesn't make a ton of sense, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it still does because you still get the operational benefits from it. Uh, there's definitely a happy middle ground, and I know that Netflix is moving towards potentially using something uh, as containerization to speed up uh, the whole the whole process. Mm -hmm. uh, so you the containers will be baked into the machine image, uh, but then as you're rapidly iterating, you can quickly wrap uh, iterate on your containers faster than you can your fully baked images. Okay. I've got a question from user at Reddit called or username Mustang two thousand two, and the question is: Do you foresee any limit to how much you can expand the current system before needing to do a major overhaul? At at Netflix. Netflix, uh, yeah. That system is pretty robust, the way it's been designed. Uh, I mean, there's always small changes to be made as scale new scaling limits are hit, but I think that one will have a lot of years left in its growth. Do you think that's because they switched to a microservice architecture? Yeah, I do, and it's because what it means is that if any one particular service starts to have scaling issues, they can re-architect that one service to match, you know, to, to meet their needs. Mm -hmm. The whole system doesn't have to be re-architected. So, Jeremy, I want to take just a, a really short minute to share a message from, from the sponsor, Rollbar. And I mentioned Rollbar at Scale Your Code during the intro, and I'm making all of our error handling use it now. Here's why. Say if we have a potential sponsor like Rollbar, for example, that submits a request through our site, but our third-party email API just stops working and returns an error. Without Rollbar, I'd probably lose that error message forever. With Rollbar, I can log it with all the submitted details, go in the dashboard, pull out the contact info, and form a relationship. What about errors in development, or errors that make it out to production, your users keeps running into them, but you don't even know they exist? With Rollbar, you can see exactly what time they happened, how many times they happened, what line of code caused it, what deploy, who deployed it, and so much more. Go to try.rollbar.com slash SYC. It takes five minutes to set up. I set it up with Laravel, super easy. You could do it with any other language, any other tool. Go to try.rollbar.com slash SYC. Thanks for sponsoring the show. So Jeremy, how important is tracking at Netflix and Reddit? You mean this time of error tracking that Rollbar does? Yeah. It's mm -hmm. actually really important. In fact, at Reddit, we built a very similar system, very poorly, but we built a very <laughs> similar system 
that essentially fingerprints error messages and tells us how often any particular error was happening. So I'm actually really excited to see Rollbar because it's it's like a commercial version of that thing that we built for ourselves. Uh, but it's it was super handy uh, because you would be able to see that a particular type of error suddenly increase. Uh, at Netflix, we have uh, we sort of look at it a bit of a higher level than the errors coming out of the code. Uh, generally, we're not looking at the errors in the code unless we're trying to debug a particular problem. Uh, we're monitoring more high-level application metrics. So that comes from both the server side and the client side. At Netflix, we have a nice advantage in that we control the client. So we can put a lot of instrumentation directly into the client. Uh, and then that feeds right into the, the Netflix system. Uh, and the nice thing is that since it's coming from the client, it's taking a different path to get into the system and so we can actually have alerts on comparisons of the same metric monitor from the client side and the server mm -hmm. side to let us know if there's a mismatch. Uh, so play starts is one of those, right? We mm -hmm. can monitor when someone hits play on the client side and when we have received that message on the server side and make sure that they're tracking in line with each other, for example. So when we just started talking about Netflix, I spoke about how you transfer data to the user and then from the user back to Netflix, such as the uh, when you click the play button, how long does it take to load the video, that sort of thing. Yeah. How do you handle that much data going back and forth like that? Yeah, so we like to joke that Netflix is a logging service that happens to play movies. <laughs> uh, and there's a ton of data coming back in. And luckily, a lot of that is just handled by Amazon. Uh, so you know, because it's horizontally scaling right there on Amazon, it's never been a huge problem to deal with the incoming flow of data. Uh, it comes into basically two different places. It comes in, there's one endpoint for all of that um, the client side logging and then the other endpoint is the API so the API is basically the one front door to all of Netflix for all of the clients uh, and so the API service is just really good at scaling uh, they are they represent a good chunk of the the, the infrastructure at Netflix uh, and so a lot of it is just coming in through the API and then it's being spread out to the various services that need whatever information is coming in so do you, do you have multiple different load balancers? So you have a front end load balancer where your users go ahead and, and, it, and then it selects which API to give the request to and then you have other load balancers that talk to the, the rest of the microservices? How does that work? Yeah, yeah. So uh, essentially when you hit the API, you're going to hit a, uh, an ELB, an Amazon ELB, and that's going to direct you to our own, to Netflix's own uh, internal layer seven load balancer called Zool, which is actually open source. Oh, okay. uh, and what that does is it, it routes based on request type as well as having the ability to write small chunks of code to do more advanced routing. Uh, and then that will route it to the appropriate API machine uh, or potentially backend service. Uh, but then within the API machine, it will uh, process for, it'll, it'll do all the processing and reach out to all of the services behind using an uh, on-instance load balancer, which is uh, also open source, uh, called uh, Ribbon. And so it'll hit that load balancer, and that will farm out to all of the microservices behind. Mm -hmm. And so the API is really interesting, because what it can do is to enable rapid iteration for the UI teams, they can actually write small chunks of code to create their own API endpoints for their service. So they can say, like, here are the 20 things that I'm going to need to know. And so they'll create a single API endpoint that returns all 20 things in one request. Uh, and then that code actually runs on the API machine. Uh, and it will uh, you know, farm out the, the requests and gather all the data and bring it back and send it all back in a single answer. How many machines are we talking about here in general? Uh, thousands. The API, thousands. The API farm itself is thousands. Wow. <laughs> That's a lot of machines. Yeah. <laughs> So what's the secret to serving so much video content? I mean, you know, I'm, I have these video interviews. I'm able to offload that to something like YouTube or, Vi or Vimeo, mm -hmm. use their bandwidth. They take care of the CDN and all that. How does Netflix do it? Because they have to do all the heavy lifting. What's the secret behind serving video? Yeah, so at Netflix, we, they, they cheat. Uh, the video itself doesn't come from Amazon. Uh, it comes from a CDN. It used to be coming from uh, Limelight, Level 3, and Akamai. Mm -hmm. But now it actually just comes from the Netflix CDN itself. <coughs> it's called Open Connect, is that right? Yeah, so the Open Connect project is so the way we've built our CDN is actually open source, uh, and it uh, 
essentially these are machines that are highly optimized to deliver large files hmm. and that's it. Uh, it's, they're so optimized for that in fact that Netflix still uses Akamai for all of the small assets because it wouldn't make sense to use the Netflix CDN because it's so optimized for serving large files. <laughs> uh, and essentially those are just physical boxes with lots of disk drives spread out all over the world uh, in various tiers. So uh, like in one place there might be a data center with a couple of racks that has the entire Netflix library and then there might be another data center somewhere that has like maybe the 80% most popular stuff. And so when your client is trying to watch a video, if you're watching the really popular stuff, you'll be directed to the client, the CDN closest to you that has that content. So the longer tail the stuff you're trying to watch, the further you basically have to go to get that content. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then the client has intelligence built right into it uh, that essentially determines which place to grab the video from. So the API will send back and say, the video that this person is trying to watch is available on, say, these 10 CDN servers. At that point, it's up to the client to pick the one that it, ha that it feels is best. So it actually will test them all, determine latency, and it'll keep running those tests throughout the video process. Uh, and so that's called the, um, and so it'll switch automatically between CDNs and between uh, bitrate levels and you know, quality, basically. So that's the whole adaptive streaming. So it's always doing tests and determining what sort of level of bandwidth it's able to get and getting the highest possible quality at the lowest possible latency. So CDNs is really the magic in serving this kind of content? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's for, for static content, recorded content like this interview. Sure. Life is a totally different ballgame. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I read somewhere that they're run on Nginx, right? Is that right? Yeah, so they're super highly optimized Nginx mm -hmm. boxes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what's the difference between a service like Akamai or Open Connect and CloudFront, for example? Did you ever, did you guys ever use CloudFront and then move to something else? How yeah, so CloudFront is just another CDN, mm -hmm. very similar to Akamai. It's not optimized for uh, large video. I mean, so okay, so it's not as performant if you have large videos like that. Well, nobody's as performant as the one that was built specifically to serve Netflix video, but mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. for for serving Netflix video. Mm -hmm. yeah. And here's another question from. Username Chef Lady Boyarde, what advice would you give to someone looking to build a video streaming site? Uh, well, if you're just starting out, you there's probably going to be other options for you to leverage. But if for some reason you want to totally build your own, uh, look at the big CDNs because they'll definitely get you bootstrapped and get get you started. They serve mm -hmm. Netflix well for many years, mm -hmm. uh, and don't try to serve it out of Amazon yourself. <laughs> uh, let's see any other tips and tricks you can think of or is that is that really the secret sauce right there yeah I mean serving a video site is really no different than serving any other type of content mm -hmm. um, it's just a large file like any other serving any other large file so there's really no spe tricks or tips that are unique to video in that respect at least recorded video mm -hmm. so what would you say was your biggest bottleneck that you had to deal with you when you were there uh, the biggest bottleneck is probably just the speed at which we could horizontally scale. Uh, so when a big spike in traffic came in, right, it's getting that startup time down uh, and dealing with uh, fan out in the API, right? It's, it's reducing the number of uh, re back requests that happen in the back end mm -hmm. to, you know, come up with the same answer. So like uh, redundant... Uh, calls, for example, trying to reduce those things like that, mm -hmm. and the uh, the baking as well, reducing that time that it takes to, to yeah, get those machines up. Yeah, reducing the and... bake time definitely helped. Mm. That one wasn't a huge issue, but okay. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Simeon Army and what you're able to test with that, and how to get started using it? Yeah, so the Simeon Army basically tests your ability to withstand various types of failure cases that happen in any distributed em environment. Uh, the Chaos Monkey tests loss of an instance. Uh, Chaos Gorilla tests loss of an entire data center, basically. Uh, and it goes from there. The, so the, the, those are the, kind of the two really important ones, along with Latency Monkey. So the big, that's the big one, because in a distributed environment, there's going to be two types of outages, right? There's going to be not available and slow. And not available is actually fairly easy to detect. It's, it's either there or it's not. It's slow that's actually really hard to deal with because, first of all, what is slow? 
Well, it depends on the service, right? It depends on what you expect that back end to do, how long you can wait for that back end. So it's kind of different for every single microservice that you're hitting. Uh, so that's one is tuning those numbers, figuring out like what's your timeout, what's an appropriate amount of time to wait for an answer or things like that. Uh, and so latency monkey is just really handy in testing that kind of thing mm -hmm. uh, because it induces latency to the request so you can see where your system breaks down. Because that's typically where you're going to get a breakdown in a distributed system, right? The, the biggest expense of a distributed system is moving data from one place to another. So when that slows down, that's going to really affect your entire performance. And you mentioned earlier how you guys have three different available availability zones, and you mm -hmm. will literally go in and, and cut one off, like destroy or shut one down, just to see how the other two are able to handle it, right? Yeah, actually shut down all the instances mm -hmm. in that third zone. And that's the same thing with Chaos Monkey, where it just deletes random instances, yeah. and that way you can see how the other ones are able to, to withstand the, the shock right. and things like that. And, and, and originally, Chaos Monkey would find a lot of problems, <clears throat> but nowadays it barely finds anything Mm -hmm. uh, because everyone knows it's coming, which is exactly what you want, right? You don't, but you're never going to stop running Chaos Monkey because then you get complacent and you don't know that your system still works. Right. So all of these testing systems, the goal is when you first run the tests to find the problems uh, and then to continue running the tests to make sure that you haven't introduced new ones. It's essentially a form of regression testing. You want to make sure that you haven't regressed in your ability to right. withstand failure. Can you think or remember back to one of the issues you saw from using Chaos, Mon Chaos Monkey? I can't even say that word. Chaos sure. Monkey. And uh, that, that just shocked you the most? You didn't expect to see that kind of, of issue? Uh, I can't think of one where Chaos Monkey caused a huge problem. Um, by the time I got there, even Chaos Monkey was already pretty effective in getting okay. people to do the right thing. There were definitely cases where Chaos Monkey would run and somebody would say like, ah, my entire thing died. And it's like, well, that's because you were saving all of your critical data on a single machine. Um, <laughs> so you've learned your lesson. But uh, if the Chaos Gorilla has found some really interesting stuff about, you know, like it's, it, basically issues about how the data was not, the requests were not being distributed evenly or the data was not distributed evenly. And so when you lost a particular zone, suddenly the other two just got far too overloaded to handle that issue. Uh, most of them are now solved. The interesting work now is happening at the uh, Chaos Kong, uh, which is the one that actually shuts, it, it doesn't actually shut down whole regions, but it shifts rapidly shifts traffic away from one region to another. And that's still cause, causing issues to this day? You know, they're still working well, on Well, there's that one's still definitely a surfacing things. They're not mm -hmm. really they don't really cause customer facing issues at this point um, but it's it's definitely doing a good job of still servicing new new issues particularly are just around uh, synchronizing two different regions right and mm -hmm. keeping how do you handle when the traffic suddenly jumps from one region to another to make sure that that experience still works mm -hmm. so part of for example site reliability engineers job or chief architect job is to automate as much as possible right can yeah. you think of things that you guys were able to automate at Netflix that most people don't really think about automating? Mm -hmm. Well, see, that's a tough question for me because when I think about doing stuff, it seems like a no-brainer, but then I talk to other people who are like, oh, wow, right. <laughs> amazing idea. So, like, uh, so a lot of the stuff that people are surprised that we had automated are even things like deployment. Right, uh, continuous deployment, continuous delivery. A lot of people still aren't doing that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, automating the auto scaling, right? That's that's a huge thing. Auto scaling has existed at Amazon for a long time, and very very few people use it. Um, automating. What do you think that is? Because it's hard. It's hard to get right. Uh, it's hard to tune your auto scaler. It's hard to figure out when it's working correctly. It's just, it's just hard to do it well. That seems to be the recurring theme in this interview specifically where, you know, when you have a smaller team like that, it's just you don't have the resources to really work on or to really come out with the solutions that will solve long-term problems, right? You kind of have to yeah. patch things up and then as you grow the team, as you grow the revenue, then you're able to actually do what the, the, the big companies are able to do, like Netflix, for example. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Earlier you talked about uh, how, how it takes longer to, to do changes in your, inf or in your development and infrastructure. 
Can you walk us through the, the entire process, or not really the entire process, but the general process of changing something in the infrastructure at Netflix? What happens w when you try to do that? So uh, are you talking about like deploying code or? Yeah, or deploying code, for example. Yeah, so deploying code, the way that works is, is you check in your code to the repository. Uh, that kicks off uh, a bake, which essentially builds a full machine image that will run your code. Uh, and that bake takes a couple of minutes. So if you are trying to rapidly iterate, that's where you're going to get stuck. Uh, and so because it'll bake that image, launch it in test, you go and you run your test, and then you launch mm -hmm. it in production. Okay. So there's sort of a flow there. And, and there is automation coming to more automation being added so that that entire flow happens automatically, but you're still going to have to wait for it. Um, and so what a lot of people do to speed that up is, you know, they'll have their machine running in test, they'll make their code change and just immediately copy it off to the test environment, mm. push it, the code out directly, and then run the tests. And that works pretty well because especially if you're just making application changes, you're, you're going to be pretty safe with that. Um, and then once they get it going in test, then they will launch it, you know, make one fully baked, put it in production. Sometimes people will actually get to the point of pushing it straight out to production as well, uh, just to get, you know, they need the production data or they want to see production traffic or whatever. It's totally up to each team how they decide to run their development. Some teams are very loose with their, you know, just straight up developing right on production machines. It, it's up to each team to decide. The, the main concept of Netflix is to provide the tools to developers to make it easy for them to do their job, but it's up to them to decide how they want to do their job. Before, right before I forget, I was going to say that if you're interested in, in learning more about continuous integration and de delivery, check out my episode. Uh, it's a few episodes back. I don't remember which one it is, but it's with the CTO of CodeShip. Mm -hmm. And we talk about how that works and how they make it happen at CodeShip and other companies like CircleCI and things like that. So definitely check that out. But as you just said, Netflix maintains a culture of freedom and responsibility yes. as I saw it. What, what does that mean? How is this different than regular companies or other companies? So the way it's different is that it manifests itself in interesting ways. The idea is that, you know, you are a responsible adult and you have the freedom to do what you think is the right thing to do and then you have to take responsibility for those decisions that you made. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you think the right thing to do right now is to deploy your code directly to production without testing it, that's up to you. You can go do that. Nobody's going to stop you. Now, if you break all of Netflix because of it, you're going to have to take responsibility for that. <laughs> right. And if you don't, then great, you've, you know, you've succeeded in your task. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the general idea behind everything, and it's pervasive throughout. I mean, it, it, it goes to the expense policy, right? The expense policy is do what you think is the right thing to do. And if you go and you spend thousands of dollars on, on too much liquor or something, then you know somebody's going to tell you that you need to be responsible for that. But right. nobody does because they know that they have to be responsible. Sure. But it's just, that's the idea. The idea is to get out of people's way. Like the security group at Netflix, they don't approve anything. They monitor, they scan, uh, they suggest, but they're never a block. You never have to go through security to, to get something done. It's always some, you know, security makes suggestions and provide tools to help you make the right decisions, but it's ultimately up to you to make the decision. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit more about how you hire people, especially engineers, uh, as you were a chief architect at both Reddit and Netflix, the whole hire pr process behind that. But right before I do that, I wanted to mention that you used Cassandra at Netflix too, right? We spoke about it for yeah. Reddit. Can you tell us a little bit more about what kinds of data you use Cassandra for and why so, you chose Cassandra? So at Netflix, Cassandra is basically the main data store for pretty much everything. Uh, there's an entire team of people who run the, the Cassandra infrastructure. And uh, it, so it works really well. Mm -hmm. uh, so pretty much everything is stored in Cassandra. Mm -hmm. That speaks volume for, for the software, that's for yeah. sure. Yeah, <laughs> uh, well, it speaks volume for the team that maintains it as well. That too, <laughs> yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. All right, let's talk more about Cloud Native. I'm really curious about why you co-founded this company. What's so the vision behind it? The vision behind it is to essentially eliminate that overhead that we talked about before. It almost sounded like you were shilling for me before when you were talking about why companies don't do microservices. But yeah. we swear, you haven't been paid to say that. No, I was not. <laughs> uh, that was the idea, that's the idea behind Cloud Native, is mm -hmm. to essentially bring the sort of architectural style of Netflix, Pinterest, Airbnb to the masses, to everybody. Mm -hmm. So that 
because we think that it is the right way to build an infrastructure for long-term reliability and scalability. And a lot of startups want to build it that way, but they don't because of the time and cost of doing so. So by providing uh, you know, this platform, the startups can use it from the get-go and have it you know, throughout their life. The enterprises who want to move to the cloud can just jump over and do it. And the people who move to a new company and have built this three times at their last three companies could be like, you know what, I'm really tired of building a microservices platform. I'm just going to use Cloud Native to do it instead. I see what you mean. That does sound exactly like what I was just talking about earlier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is not just for larger scale companies. This is also for startups, smaller businesses, right? Yeah, yeah. The idea is that it's, it'll apply to everybody. Mm -hmm. In yeah. fact, it's really great for startups because it can get them on the path of microservices right from the beginning. So that's where most of your clients are or customers are? Uh, well, no, it's actually across the mix, but okay. uh, that's one, one group that might find it particularly compelling. Mm -hmm. Here's another question from user name Will R. Stern. What are some best practices you've learned to keep deployments as simple and as bulletproof possible, especially when deploying major infrastructure slash data alterations? I feel like that kind of ties in with that. Yeah, so the best practices are, so for data, the best thing that I found is you you deploy a you don't try to do like a, a stop the database and change the table kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You do an intermediate step where you bring up a new table that has the new schema, and you start uh, you write a chunk of code that essentially knows how to read and write to both old and new. And so every time a request comes in, it does both. Uh, and then you have a back channel process that migrates the data from the old to the new. Uh, that hasn't been migrated through the code just actively doing it uh, because that will give you a no downtime schema change. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you can, that seems to be the best way to get a no downtime schema change. Now, you can just take a downtime and make a schema change, uh, yeah. which can work, but can be risky if it fails for some reason. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think it seems like I read that this is the service is not just for base AMIs or images, but also for clean installs with Chef and Puppet, right? You can support all those different ones across the board. It doesn't have to be just baking. Uh, are you talking about um, Cloud Native? Yes. Yeah. 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 Cl well, so Cloud Native, the, right now, the system is designed for fully baked images, mm -hmm. but you can use Chef, Puppet, Ansible, et cetera, to create your image. Mm -hmm. I'm going to yeah. have to do some more playing around with that. That's That sounds like a very interesting concept, the whole yeah. baking concept and all that. Yeah, yeah. And so the nice thing about what we built the Cloud Native is that then once you have your baked image, you have a deployable unit. Uh, and so you can then go and create clusters with auto-scaling, and we do all the auto-scaling for you. We set it all up and manage it for you. Mm -hmm. And this is cloudnative.io if anybody wants to check it out. Yeah. So Jeremy, how do you get the skills necessary to work at the scale that you've worked at? <laughs> do you have to just crash a party at Y Combinator or with Paul Graham no. and get to know some startup? How, how does it work? How do you do it? Uh, well, actually, crashing the party does help. Although, to be fair, I didn't crash the party. I was invited. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, that does help. Uh, a lot of the stuff I learned just by, by doing it, by uh, f essentially finding any opportunity to do something new and different and taking that opportunity. So, you know, when I started my career, I was uh, in IT and I would look for any opportunity where somebody needed a new server set up or, you know, some new thing set up and I'd be like, yeah, I'll, I'll do it, I'll learn it, I'll spend extra time uh, to figure it out, uh, you know, on my own time and do it. Uh, I ran a bunch of infrastructure at my house so that I get a lot of experience that way. <laughs> really the best way to learn this stuff is to just do it for something, you know, if, if if some company doesn't want you to do it for them, go and start your own project and do it, you know, for yourself. Uh, start a little hobby project. You'd be surprised how much work is involved just in a hobby project. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a lot of how it was learned, and just you know, making your own luck, right? Is is find an opportunity and go seek it out. Uh, like what I did with the Y Combinator guys, right? I was at that party and I saw the Reddit guys, and I went and I talked to them. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you just gotta like kind of go and, and seek out what it is you want to do. So when hiring people, like for example, you want to hire a site reliability engineer or something mm -hmm. like that, what do you look for? Do you do you put more stress on the technical expertise or on the ambition behind the person? How does that work? So particularly for a site reliability engineer, what I'm looking for is somebody who has a passion 
for the customer and advocating for the customer and the customer experience, particularly always having a good one. So, you know, I want a site reliability engineer who essentially wants to come in and make sure that, so at Netflix, for example, that somebody can always watch their movie. That's what I want. Now, as far as experience goes, somebody who has experience both coding and running an infrastructure is, is going to be the best. Uh, but, you know, you can learn you can learn one skill or the other to some extent. Obviously, you're going to be better if you have experience. Uh, but the main skill that you need to have is this ability to handle, uh, you know, emergency situations, this ability to stay, uh, stay cool under pressure mm -hmm. and to really be able to step back and think about the experience from the customer. Like, how do we make it so that the customer gets their experience back as quickly as possible? And then how do we go and diagnose and fix this issue? Uh, so that I mean that's really important is what a lot of people kind of get stuck on is oh I need to figure out what broke and so they'll start diving in and looking at logs and whatever and it's really important for you to understand like that's great but more importantly I want you to get our customers back online first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting thought. I yeah. like that. One more question. Uh, actually I thought I had more questions but <laughs> winding down here and again this is from user name Will R. Stern. And this is, I think, I feel like this is a good loaded finishing question. What are some scaling anti patterns pertaining mostly to architecture, like microservices, mm -hmm. service oriented architecture, et cetera? So, scaling anti patterns, like uh, essentially, you're looking for things that people would be surprised about doing, right? So, I'd say that the fully baked images is probably one of those mm -hmm. uh, that people don't think of, at least. It's actually a pattern, but people probably think of it as an NFT pattern. Uh, the other, I guess the other pattern, anti-pattern would be uh, different data stores for each service. So that's actually a big pattern for microservices, but a mm -hmm. lot of people think that, uh, so a lot of people want to build, you know, they have their, their single database that has everything to do all their joins, but uh, you know, that is just going to get you into trouble because then you still have your single point of failure. It's just further back in the stack. So dividing up your databases, uh, you know, one database per service, basically, so that each one can do their own. And if you need to join data between them, then that gets moved down into the software. Mm -hmm. So that's the really important part, right, is, is if you need to join data from multiple databases, that's happening now in the software instead of the database. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was a really cool interview because we got to see two different giants, you know, the, the Reddit community and you have the Netflix and they all have their own technical challenges. And thankfully, you've been able to participate in <laughs> and seeing the growth of both of them. So it was really good having you on the show, Jeremy. Yeah. Really appreciate it. If people want to get in touch with you, how should, how should they do that? Uh, they can just send me an email, Jedberg Gmail, uh, okay. if they want to get in touch. Or you know, they can hit me on Twitter, although I'm not uh, always looking at my Twitter. So <laughs> <laughs> Too busy working, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> well, sure. I'm just more on email than Twitter, I suppose. Sure, OK. Yeah, and again, check out his uh, his company, cloudnative.io. They're working on some really interesting pain points, so do check that out. And thanks, everybody, for watching. If you enjoyed this interview, if you learned from this interview, please leave a comment and let Jeremy know how much you appreciate it, because I certainly appreciate it a lot. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks Hope you all have me. a wonderful day. You too. Take care. Bye-bye.